Crohn's. How long would you be sitting through all the announcements? That's what it is. You wake up and you think you're going to be in the, the, the uh, Guruaj Loka or Krishna Loka or whatever you were taught. Like Sujay last night was saying, this is just stuff. It's just opinions. It's just stuff we've heard, including everything Guruaj ever told us. It's just stuff we've heard. Anyway, we supposedly, Guru Rai says, whatever you know, you, 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 your habits of mind, the other people say this too, for whatever it's worth, say whatever your habits of mind, that's what you, that's what you, you, you get. <laughs> that's what you get. So if you're in an endless shopping mall someplace, <laughs> no. you know, looking for like, you know, fish tacos, a decent fish taco, you know. For 20 bucks. And yeah, yeah. In the Bardo, that's what you're going to do. You're going to be looking for fish tacos. <laughs> Bardo. Bardo is where you go. What do you mean, when? The place? Is that Tibetan? Already we're in the mind. Yeah, it's a, a new idea. <laughs> That's a new idea. When you're not here, you're there. Yeah, wherever you go, there you are. <laughs> the NDE says the easiest, most beautiful thing, and after they've come back, they wish they would have stayed there. So death is supposed to be beautiful. Yep. And other people say it's horrifying. <laughs> So take your pick. <laughs> <laughs> they do. There's other people okay, say that when yeah. you die, it, it's like a horrible yeah. experience. So the okay. Tibetans say okay. it scares the shit out of you. So <laughs> take your pick. <laughs> <bed. laughs> I showed up ready to do. I told video of a sad <clears throat> saying. How would you say goodbye? You know, and our guru talks about, of course. Uh, uh, the process of manifestation and not creation and the patternings and all that stuff and we've had a lot of that so far this course. It's like that's one of the themes of course. And then we had that amazing sat saying yesterday that uh, the sealer brought up that just blew logic and sense out of the water. The, the sat saying on the shitrons and the, the sat saying on the uh, uh, Surprising revelation that our guru has announced uh, that uh, he was a male prostitute. <laughs> <laughs> Again? <laughs> I, thought, I thought, how many how many spiritual teachers announced that they're male? <laughs> That's how we started out, right? Remember his organization started out 500 people before we got in? <laughs> Things like that would... Well, that's part of the, the mythos of... Uh, and uh, we've had a lot of very powerful satsangs about the nature of mind, what the Buddhists call it, the nature of mind. And a quick word about the Buddhists, with whom I've spent a great deal of time over the last 12 years. They don't laugh nearly as much at this place. And I get the giggles in Buddhism, and uh, a lot of it's silly, really silly stuff. Uh, the Karmapa, there's a lot of silly shit around the Karmapa, and uh, the Dalai Lama, there's, there's actually a lot of silliness around the Dalai Lama. Sometimes I think he knows it. <laughs> but I think he likes the Dalai Lama to be serious. That's why he hangs around serious people. Like in our culture, physicists are serious, and the neurophysiologists are serious, and uh, the, the uh, nature of mind people are serious. Is Kim Wilber serious? Or is he kind of a poof? What do you think? People know who Kim Wilber is? Is Ajahn Shanti serious? No. Mm -hmm. I think he is. Yeah. He's pretty serious. Yeah. <laughs> you go to him, he's pretty serious. It's what face. other, what's that? It's face. Yeah, he likes it. <laughs> 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 he likes being light. He just radiates. He looks, he glows. And he looks terrific. You know, he looks up there. Like a California Buddha, he is, <laughs> and I think a guy's great. But he's really serious. I think about what? What are we supposed to think? Our guru does about 20 minutes of a good, great stuff, right? That that rest that satsang was really great stuff. The nature, of divine will, and great stuff. And he sort of checks his watch out. Well, uh, <laughs> gotta fill in some time here, and he launches into something else. I can't remember. Then we got on the subject of. Bull, 
bullshit, and then somehow we got into cows, and all our minds immediately started going south, right about there, like, where are we going with this? And he gleefully decides, let's go. Put the, the bull out with the cows, okay, and, and he kind of made a metaphor out of it. He said, well, you know, just let the cows and the bulls do what they want. We all felt, I did, comforted, oh, okay. Let the mind do its <laughs> bloody nonsense over here, and I'm going to focus on God, right? I'm going to focus on, on emptying the mind of distracting thoughts, and I'm going to focus on Guru Shakti, and even though I know there's no goal, because I know this stuff pretty well, I nevertheless I'm going to have the goal of like clearing out the muck, right, and then obtaining a higher level of consciousness. So that's all good. And I felt so far we're safe. He took us into dangerous waters there. Uh-oh. Bulls servicing the cow. I, I, oh, okay, wait, wait. And then he's safely, oh, safe. It was just a metaphor. Okay. Whew. I'm safe. I'm back in familiar spiritual territory. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But he had already gone to cows. And then and servicing cows. And then before we know it, we were in like, oh my god, male prostitute. Now where does my head go with male prostitution? I immediately picture people in, in dank bathrooms, you know, doing cheap tricks, you know, and, and man, you know, this stuff oh. is a little uncomfortable to us when my, my head goes there. And then it kind of flashed on. Do you remember that movie from the 70s, uh, A Midnight Cowboy? It was, you know, about this poor pathetic guy from somewhere wearing a cowboy hat who thought he was going to service rich women, and instead he's, he's doing cheap tricks in Times Square. You know, it's a sordid stuff. In our culture, especially prostitution, you know, it's very sordid. It's like something you don't want to talk about. And also, people who get caught up in prostitution scams or scandals, we think less of them. Politicians. Mm -hmm. You know, politicians, we think less of them. Like our, our uh, you know, I I'm, I'm think I'm still fond of Bill Clinton like this, but Bill, come on. How did you fall for something like that? Come on. You're supposed to be a smart guy. What an idiot. You know, so we think less of them instead of like thinking better of them. Who was there? Was an Italian prime minister, I think, that they tended to think like, you would judge like how classy your mistress was. You know, it's just. Anyway. So, and I was there listening to my guru, and he was giggling about it. He thought it was just the funniest thing in the world. So all I could think of was, well, he's so naive that when he tells his audience, and this was being recorded, <laughs> I was a male prostitute. And then he talks about how to conduct the business. And it's, you think, okay, pr male prostitute. And I think, well, you know, servicing the needs of others, okay. You know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's, that's good, right? You know, uh, uh, and then I think, that, but no, he, he's tricking people. He says he would get the one woman to give him a suit of clothes, and then he'd get the other woman to give him money, and I thought, oh, that's, that's pretty sordid. I mean, that's, he was already enlightened, you see, Jeff. That, that, see, that explains us. He was enlightened, so he could do anything he wants. Yeah. Does that mean he can kill people? No, or what does that mean? He could rip us off? No, he never did. Oh, he never did? Oh, so he was dishonest then, but with us, he's honest. I think he always gave, 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 which was always the positive. Yeah, that's so what even seemed. he could be a good prostitute. So maybe when he ripped this woman off, or he was taking money from one woman to give to another, maybe he was very good. Anyway, you can you can go this, but so the male prostitute thing. What on what on earth was that about? Now, I am excellent at rationalization, I think all of you are too, and I tend to find spiritual meanings in any kind of nonsense. I will find spiritual meanings. Big Dharma movies for me is Gone with the Wind. <laughs> Citizen Kane, huge Dharma movies. Uh, it's a wonderful life. I think our whole American culture, you know, I think these things are beautiful, you know. Can I find spiritual messages in, in Midnight Cowboy? Yeah, maybe. You know, mm -hmm. but not necessarily. Our, our guru seemed very happy and thrilled about it. So I said, so then my mind going after listening to this, and it started flashing on everything that you guys have been teaching me. Like Sunita and all these conversations that I hear, and people talk to me about things, and I overhear things like all of you guys. Don't you wander around, you have these great, crazy, uh, com at, like at lunch companies, and we were joking outrageously about how are we going to make some money from this? I know. You know, we were talking about, 
I won't rehearse the whole conversation, but kidding all the time, but also keeping my ears open and just remembering things that people are saying. And also bits and fragments out of satsangs, various, you know, like basically, you know, Pasha, your satsang was about how to let it all go, but it was also about hoarding, you know, and keeping things in rooms and thinking about, and everybody contributing something. And then Babita, we were outside, Lorietta and I, and, and listening to those outrageous frogs. And one of the things I love about the theory of evolution, besides which it makes absolutely no sense, and people get upset, are you a creationist? And they think, I don't know, I mean, I just look at the facts. If frogs are supposed to be designed for survival, does it make any sense for a frog this big to make an incredible <laughs> racket that sounds like a car backfiring? It makes it that much. Why? Why? I mean, why? Or you want to play it? I don't know if you can hear it. This technology, so it won't work. I think everybody's heard it. Yeah. I think it's all right, though. It's for the, it's for the people. You know why? It, after it. This is technology, and if it works at all, if anything around here works at all, then of course it's like, I actually I get nervous if it actually does <laughs> You see if you can find it, but the frog yeah. makes so much racket. What possible survival mechanism that that has? However, I've been to school and I realize sexual selection is also a powerful force in evolution. Make note of that. Sexual selection is a powerful force in evolution. Make note of that. Many, many species have extravagant, crazy displays. Right, right. Why? Because they want to get it on. Not only that, but they have a whole bunch of them, like a bunch of antelopes out in the field. They have different kinds of crazy horns. Why? For survival? No, just because they want to show off. <laughs> they want everybody to see it. And the moose with the biggest horns gets the most female mooses. <laughs> All right, right? Okay, it's like there, the frogs with the biggest croak gets laid the most, <laughs> as the most froggy eggs. Actually, I think they have eggs first, and then, they, no, they don't, fer they fertilize each other, and then they lay no, the eggs, they or do they fertilize the eggs? eggs. <laughs> then why are they croaking at each other? They usually clear in our stuff. They're, they're doing that with the sound. Her eggs and what are they doing? Okay, so they do need, and then she can get to the moon and she's squirting eggs all over the place. You also know I've heard that we as human beings, our pheromones are constantly influencing, and women who live together, I think, supposedly, they all, their, their cycles begin to harmonize because they're so in touch with each other on a biological level. Not supposedly. <laughs> you also, I've read descriptions, you know why we have lips and we have eyebrows. So we don't make them up. <laughs> and the guys have broad shoulders, and the women have breasts, and we stand up like this. It's all about communicating each other on the level of pleasure, hmm. and just being with one another and enjoying one another. So all this stuff I was flashing on, I started to think about our guru grew up in an Indian culture, and Indian spirituality is through and through his teachings. And I was very moved when Priscilla, you came in yesterday and you showed us a somewhat alien but still more familiar symbol. You said the mother and child, which is a universal symbol, but in this particular it's the Catholic version of the, this universal symbol. You told us, meditate on, bit on what, what this means to you, find your own. And you brought up the metaphor of our birth inside of ourselves of the Christ. You know, we literally give birth to our own Christ. You know, it's one of the ways you can meditate on that image. And yesterday when we were all joking around back here and somehow Kali came up, or Durga, mm -hmm. and somebody asked me who or what's Durga, and I said, it's the woman. And then one of you got kind of like, what are you talking about, the woman? What does that mean? And then we're, okay. Well, we had to explain a little more about Kali and Durga and Mahadevi. And I realized Mahadevi, people, what, what is Mahadevi? But then we flashed on Krishna, Lord Krishna. Krishna came. And uh, I mentioned that Krishna, some people knew, but everybody's heard of Krishna. Some people flashed on Krishna, you know, like the little blue guy. So there's a cartoon version of Krishna, I think. And then I mentioned that Krishna always has orange pants or gold colored pants. Mm -hmm. And somebody was very intrigued by that. And they said, I think it was you, John, you said something like, uh, oh, you know, pretty, what did, I forgot how you phrased right. it. Mm -hmm. you said, well, I think it might have been CJ, but it had something to do with. 
be being gay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then I said, I like, well, he went both ways. He does, he's, he, he, he loved everybody. <laughs> so the go pee, I can speak from personal experience that the, the go buzz are just as attractive as the go pees, although they're not betrayed. They're usually, they're back home somewhere while their wives and, and I'll tell you about the legend of, of Krishna. Then you made a really cool comment, which really helped me understand with Guraj, a direction to take this Guraj thing. Do you remember what you said? You said, you quoted a wonderful song to me, 1970s, early 80s song. It's just, I'm just a gigolo. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone I know. Well, to something. Do uh, you remember that? That's David Lee Roth. You guys remember mm -hmm. saying, I'm just a gigolo. Yeah. Da, 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 da. And I thought about that wonderful video. I thought almost about playing it for you guys of David Lee Roth in the video. First of all, young David Lee Roth, he's really gorgeous. You know, he had this beautiful long hair, and I've seen photographs, he shows himself with this wonderful hairy chest, he's really, he likes to be as sexy as he possibly can. Right, right. And he's dancing, he's got so much energy, he's just flying around. And in the American Giggle, he's making spoofing himself. He plays like a DJ, who's like, oh, Dave, and then he launches into a shtick and he goes flying through making fun of all the other pop idols, who by the way are our divinities in our culture. So I think he's got Madonna in it, and he's got uh, Prince. Talk about a Krishna-like figure. Uh, he's he's just, <laughs> just like Krishna. Yeah. Okay, and he goes flying through the various sets, yeah. all right, as he's singing about like that. He says, I'm so sad and lonely, you know, <laughs> while he goes around and he's just, you know, everybody just hires him for his affections. So anyway, I thought about Gigolo, and I thought, you know, it's like Krishna as a Gigolo. And I thought, well, that's, that's an interesting way to approach it. And then I, I just, oh my God. And I thought, here's a way to get into this material. Uh, before I go there, I'm going to offend people in the room by talking about things in which our culture is very uptight about. Okay? It's a pleasure. Our culture is deeply upset by pleasure. <laughs> Even while it lives by best it can getting us to addicted to as many services so we are serviced by Verizon Company. We pay our money, and Verizon does it for us. <laughs> and it will do it for us. Right. We are serviced by the food industry, so we'll eat all that ice cream. We're serviced by the food, but we pay our money, and it's got its hand out, or it will cut off its services. No. It gets us addicted. So granted, our culture is both deeply addicted to love to quote the Robert Palmer song, and deeply upset by it. Another thing which our culture is deeply upset about is physical beauty in other human beings. We both worship it, and we're really upset about it. Again, we worship it, and we're really upset about it. And yet, you watch on the TV, like the Academy Awards. Uh, Laura told me that if you're a woman, you're supposed to stand like this. So that you have a nice profile silhouette, you're supposed to stand like this, and you up the bus. You get work done, right? And if you're a male, there isn't so much a protocol, but I'm thinking about exquisitely beautiful males. Like Lorietta said, I was at home packing and I was chopping up wood, and I found my ideal George Clooney in Monument Men with a clip mustache. He just looked hot as a disc. Yeah. <laughs> and I also saw who's the guy who played the late, late, uh, late James Bond, uh, the, the James Bond character. What's his name? Daniel Craig. How many times is Daniel? How many times are the female characters in the recent Bond movies nude from the waist up? Oh, that not that out? Not much. Never. How many nude. times is he nude from the waist up? <laughs> 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 I'm guessing at least five times a movie because he just looks great. <laughs> and anyway, physical beauty. Also, I think sexuality in our culture, we're very confused about mm -hmm. sexuality. Everybody knows we, we have it. I think everybody knows it's, it's, we're going to do it whether you want to or not. You're going to be part of sexuality and gendering and, and all those issues. But our culture has lots and lots of issues around sexuality, especially, especially sexuality. I suspect our culture now has more anxiety and fear of sexuality than it <coughs> ever has. There's so many cases 
In fact, if I mention some of the top five issues with sexuality and the expression of sexuality, everybody's mind will immediately go into upset and they won't be able to, in fact, they're already upset, I can feel it. <laughs> so I won't even mention it. Let's just say we know what we're talking about here, right? Do you remember those innocent days of Dr. Ruth with Spiner? Or work on <laughs> <laughs> just do it. It's so good. Any way you can, just do it. <laughs> Children, is that mean with third world people that don't have any money that you buy when you go to India? Does that I mean, sorry, it got very what's that? It got very complicated and oh my, it's a complicated subject. All of this around our guru saying, I was a male prostitute. <laughs> 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 Here's some stuff behind it. Yeah, <laughs> so who was Krishna? What about Krishna? Krishna is a central, central running through many of Guruja's teachings. He talked about divinity. He mentioned Radha sometimes. Krishna was running through a strain. He never mentioned, in my mind, mentioned Ram. He mentioned Christ quite a bit. These are, Sansujay well explains that these are simple conceptual models. They are ways which experience flows in through the present, to make a complicated way of saying it. Our experience flows through these symbols and pictures and metaphors and stories. Frankly, I don't want to get rid of my story. Oh, I'll give you a major teaching. Where are you, Linda? Do you remember what you said? Uh, somehow the issue of the Swadhisthana Sakra, I did the chakra workshop, and you said something which I thought was extraordinary. Can you remember what it said when I was talking about the Swadhisthana is the pleasure chakra, and I described it as just the viva la joie de vie, you know, the, the, that chakra, the embrace of life through sex, through appetite, through everything, just wanting to get out there is the Swadhisthana. Chakra, right after the beingness is established, immediately it wants to stand up and croak like a frog or, or a calculator or something. You said, I'm interested in, in more of, you don't remember? Quite wonderful. You said you were interested in desire. And, and, desire. Yeah, you yeah. were really burning interested. Burning desire. Burning desire. And I thought that was amazing. And then uh, John, the next night, sat down with me and said, you know, Know, said something about the, the, I'm no chakra king, but I just know what I like, and I love my guru and all that, and I just, you know, I felt, you know, it was so great, you know, I, I didn't meet the man, but he's in my life everywhere, and then towards the end, we were a conversation, and you said, I'm kind of interested in the chakra stuff, where, where can I find out about it, and I told you about a, a wonderful book by a guy named Lama Yeshi, it's called Introduction to Tantra, and Tantra is spirituality of desire. Now, I'm around a lot of Buddhists. <coughs> the first phase of Buddhism is mindfulness-based training. And it's basically, would you mind if I was a little bolder? Go, go. <laughs> Keep it in your pants. Take a cool shower. Calm it down. Okay? That's insight meditation. <laughs> Look at your desire and let it go. Look at your thoughts. Let it go. Be present in the moment. Okay, and intro Buddhism is about being good with each other and con loving kindness and all that. Not a lot about that talks about the huge issues we get together with in relationships with each other when deep pleasures are involved. And I'm including sexual pleasures, the pleasures of financial security, the pleasures of just living together, and sometimes the horrors of living together. But it's very complicated. Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry, dear Buddha, you were a homeless person. Oh, I was going to diss the poor Buddha. Guess what his main problem was? <laughs> He's taught for over 80 years. Dealing with these damned monks. <laughs> <laughs> there is actually, in the Vyana, a list of do's and don'ts in Buddhism. Did you know the long list of what you tell the monks? I want you to get, you know, like, no sex, guys. That means no girls. So they, oh great, they start doing it with each other. <laughs> Don't do it with each other. Okay? And then they start doing it with animals. Don't do it with animals. And then they start doing it with skulls. Don't do it with skulls. Actually, there's a list. Don't you get it? Oh, no. so The other thing was money. 
it's the same thing going with money. It's like, no money. Well, what are we going to do, boss? We're going to pay, you know, we got to pay for the goat. We'll make him do it. And they would often get some non monk to do all the money so they could cure it. No attachment. Mm -hmm. So the Buddha had trouble. So Tantra is the first level of Buddhism. The second one is loving kindness in the heart, which totally PC. What could not? What could not be nicer? <laughs> the Vajrayana is about the science of working the way we actually are. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. We have genitals and we like them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, sometimes in a long evening. Why not? <laughs> Some of us have issues like you can't get the thing in the mood anymore. Well, it's <laughs> sad. It be fun. <laughs> you know, so we have that. And then we have stomach, unfortunately. It is mighty nice to eat. It's mighty nice. You know you're not supposed to eat so much, but oh, another <laughs> serving of that. It's yeah. good. All right. So anyway, Tantra is about how do you work with desire? Can you make desire spiritual? The answer is, of course you can, idiot. <laughs> you know, anything spiritual. Oh. Want to take the most powerful force in all of us. How many of us read uh, philosophical spiritual literature? <laughs> Actually, I read very little, and I bet you do. But I mean, you read, <laughs> you're reading like Vedanta literature, you're reading about uh, uh, scholastic Buddhism and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Sujay does a bit, you know, I'll do, I have books all over the house, but I actually, I'm, I can't read them for very long. I read them for 10 or 15 minutes and I get bored. And I have them all over, I, hundreds and hundreds of books, okay? And I listen to lectures. How many of you have gotten to the point where it's actually, the lectures, it's like, oh, that one again. <laughs> The most persistent, unavoidable aspect of our being is relentless, unappeasable desire. We, no matter how many times we have it, a couple of days or weeks or months or maybe a couple of minutes go by. <laughs> you want it again? <laughs> you want it again? <laughs> it's like, yeah, that was like, uh, uh, that's uh, Lothian Sumptons, my Tibetan teacher, that's his AKA desire, the chocolate, uh, holding up the chocolate. Mm -hmm. I'm going to read you a uh, first brief bio of Lord Krishna. Now, I'm not an expert on Lord Krishna. He is, again, an idea, an ideal, a spiritual ideal. We all know the life of Christ, right? Poor village boy. I won't rehearse the whole story, but does everybody know the life of Christ? I know it pretty well. Okay. Died, didn't do well. Yeah, but that's true. They turned it into a turned it into a, no, yeah. it into a good. They that's not nice. Nicodemus was his father. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> they nailed him up, and that's supposedly where the good George boy really, really did well. It's just I remember years ago a friend of mine, <laughs> she was not a Christian, she said, What is this? You worship, you know, a tortured man nailed to a cross, <laughs> it's weird that they made, it, they made it into something. Krishna yeah. makes a little bit more sense. So, baby mm -hmm. Krishna, born in a humble village. His, name, his nickname was Gopala. Is that right? No, yeah, Gopala. Or that is his mother. I'm not 100% sure. Devaki is his mother. Devaki? Okay. Gopala is baby Krishna. Again, the universal myth of the, the divine child. He was just freaking adorable. <laughs> he was the little kid, you know, whenever we let our kids go and they make racket, sometimes we get annoyed with the kids, but there's always little kids that we just find absolutely adorable. We let them do whatever they want. If you can't plug in the kids, plug in your favorite pet. It doesn't matter if the pet or the poops on the floor. You love that pet to death. You won't spend money on yourself, you know, to go to the doctor, but you will spend thousands at the drop of a hat for your beloved Pet. So Gopala was called the butter thief. He was mischievous. He was playful. He was always making little bits of trouble. Okay? Everybody adored him. He was radiantly beautiful. He performed miracles that people couldn't quite believe that he had done. And he was blue. 
and he was blue. <laughs> okay. He wasn't blue at a young age, was he? Or what's that? Was he blue at a young age? I don't think he was. I don't think, he was. I don't think, I think he was gold. <laughs> Poverty was, was hard for him. What's that? Blue was hard for him. It took him, took him long. So he was absolutely adorable. Remember that. Who else do we know in our experience? Mischievous. Rascally, cute. <laughs> yeah, it's like, oh, rascally guru. <laughs> okay, adorable. Then he grew up in the, the main feature. There's two other phases of Krishna that I've had, so there's four that you know of. The second one is Govinda. Okay, this one is very interesting. The sacred literature is called the Puranas, and I've read them but years ago, and I went looking on the internet for them, and the classic text, of course, you have to buy from Amazon, and I can't download it because that's one of the ones you can't buy instantly, but I figured, this is the course, of course. <laughs> course. It's about just driving you crazy. And I promised I was going to read to you guys about the life of the young Govinda. Okay? The legend has we types that need to clean it up. We can't live with the rawness of the experience. Well, I'm going to ask it, Dave. I won't ask for a show of hands. Some of us have been in love when we're 15 or 16. The Romeo and Juliet type of love. Uh, the other one is uh, if you can't plug into that memory, because a lot of us hadn't had that experience, some of us did. You were just, you couldn't, you were sick, you couldn't sleep, you know, you were up all night like that. When you finally did get together, you couldn't keep off each other. You were just at each other constantly. And that's an amazing experience, you know, and you're very fortunate if you had it in this life. For people who haven't had that experience directly, I recommend the, uh, uh, and I'm skipping ahead a little bit, the last scene of Casablanca. Uh, yeah. Ingrid Bergman, mm -hmm. Soft Light. Well, I always have Paris. <laughs> so, so you think that, you know, uh, that they, uh, our troubles don't mean a hill of beans in this crazy world. <laughs> Remember like that, he says, he says, if you don't go, you know, you'll regret it. Remember, it's very... It's me, too, again. And she looks up into his eyes, and she's willing to make the ultimate sacrifice. And they love each other so much, they just, they're desperate for each other. And you remember, they were separated, right? Okay? And then they came back, and they found each other again, and they had to separate. Like, oh, my God. Oh, gone with the wind. Frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. But, but, Red, 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 you want, you want, oh, Red, what have I done? He adored her. And Red abandons her. It's like, oh, oh. How many have seen the Zeffirelli version of Romeo and Juliet? Wasn't that, what was that name of that, that woman, that actress? Olivia. Oh, my yeah. God, was she sexy in that movie? Oh, my Lord. She was a child. She was a little down. <laughs> <laughs> PC trouble. She was a trouble. <laughs> and you remember when they finally got her on the they the, like, they couldn't let each other go in the rosy dawn. You know, and I can't do the Shakespeare like that, but they had to march. You remember all that. And then, of course, they got the troubles that they got. They got separated again. It just breaks your heart. Oh, my God. And every, the whole village is just completely destroyed by this. You know, they, everybody makes up. And, such a horrible tragedy. Well, that's exactly the plot of Krishna. I wasn't Krishna. So, uh, one of the themes which I should address right here is silence. How many people notice, first of all, chant to me is one of our most powerful spiritual practices. It's just an intense practice. How many people notice that between the chants, Self in the form of the chant had done a lot of work to make you 
break up your sequential thought making during the chant. You'll get mad at me. I'm going to give you some <laughs> advice. You try to stay conscious during the thoughts. I know it's a great time to dull. Try your best to stay conscious. And just watch that your thoughts become broken up. They're like little chunks. How many people know this enchantment? Little chunks and bits. That's the Divine Mother's work. She says, my darling, I love you so much. I'm going to take that little, what, what Sujay uh, Su called the devil. I'll take Satan out of your head for 10 minutes so you don't have to think about your ordinary banal nonsense, and I'll let you drift into this wide open, how many feel I do, an enormous space open, so just this beautiful, clean, serene space of silence. And then, God damn it, the chant starts up. <laughs> but if you get good with it, let the chant take you. <coughs> Chants going, but you don't know where you are. Stillness, silence. Okay? I'm going to tell you what that silence is, a metaphor. Next time you do the chant, the silence opens. It's a dark silence, isn't it? Is it for many of you? It's not like the brilliant, well, some of you maybe have brilliant, it's the light. <laughs> but for me, it's like this cool vastness. And I don't know where I am. Just, just there. It's just being. It's like such a being. The chant, Kali has done that for you because she loves you. She wants you to be yeah, just. Could you speak up a bit? I, she, wants, she's, she wants you to, to let that, to be there. I'm going to suggest a little twist on the metaphor twist on the experience. You're at a cool moon night. There's a full moon. You're in a sacred garden. It's the garden at Brindavan. It's a cool garden. A silent night. And you were home, chopping your vegetables, or doing what you were doing, and you thought you heard something. And you thought, I think I want to take a walk. And you left your family at home, and you, you wandered out, and you're in this forest by yourself. And it's absolutely still. And all you, you think you hear something. But it isn't. And then you actually hear it. And it's the sweetest thing you've ever heard in your life. You can't believe it. All ordinary music pales compared to this. You can't quite make it out. It sounds a little like a flute, but you can barely hear it. And then you hear it more strongly. And you can't not want it. It is the thing that you wanted all your life. This is what you've been waiting for. It's the real thing. Do you remember when you were 15 and you fall heavily in love? When you do break up, suddenly it's like you, uh, the spell breaks. <laughs> and you went left heaven you're back here. <laughs> Krishna's flute is this pure, and it's just like, you just want it. You'll do anything. That's what I've heard about what heroin addiction is like. You just, you've got to, you just can't, I'm sorry, everything else the way the legend expresses itself is everything gets left behind. Respectable people, I'll use the word, the metaphor in this case, it's often the gopis, women. Women in Hindu mythology are often considered, well, I'm not going to go into sexist stereotypes about being more receptive and motive. That's all stuff, and it's not true. But let's just say in this case, it's a feminine impulse. It's considered a feminine. The gopis are seen as, the gopas are seen as the husbands, the lawgivers, the society, the rule makers. They're the people you work for <laughs> and the people you listen to in your head. Krishna's flu comes from some other place. Uh, what's an incident from the Gospels where there's a case of respectable people having a decent jobs and they immediately leave their jobs to follow their guru? Fisherman. The disciples. The disciples. Do you remember there's records of the disciples? He would go walk in Christ, would walk in and he says, Would you two? This was uh, Peter and John. He said, follow me and become fishers yeah, of men. Yeah, follow with me. Just 
come with me. And they immediately, the, the gospels, they immediately dropped their nets and began to follow him. He walked into a tax collector. A tax collector at that time was worse than male prostitutes <laughs> and extortionists. And he said, come with me. And he just, they would just come immediately. What did Christ promise them? Oh, probably in a bad time. Mm -hmm. Nothing. <laughs> so that when you go preach the village, don't take anything with you. I don't even want you to take a no, no pair of shoes. I don't want you to take another ride. I don't want you to take any food or nothing. You just go. He promised nothing. He promised them nothing. He himself had nothing. So anyway, blue Krishna. What were they? Now remember, poets later on were trying to find words to describe what this experience is. There are people in the room that love divinity that much. You know what Krishna's flute is. No matter what, like moths to a flame. I'm going to read you, it's a little ridiculous, the poetry, okay, but I'm going to read you what was going on. Oh, by the way, I forgot to say, the gopis finally think they see him and he's immensely mischievous and playful. It's Lord Krishna. He's this big, okay, about this big. So it doesn't make any sense, like, you know, how big would you? Is he too short? Somehow when you meet him, he feels like he's human size, but he's in fourth, he's about this big. He is impossibly gorgeous. Kiana Reeves and Little Buddha, I'm sorry, doesn't come for us. Prince doesn't come for us. The most beautiful male female you can imagine. He's impossibly gorgeous. He means his name means the all attractive one. And he flirts with them. At one point they come, Lord Krishna, will you you know, we're here, we're here. Mm -hmm. They would show up in the moonlight, he would sort of half materialize and he'd say, Oh, why are you? Why why did you come to see me? We don't know, we just came. You called us. He said, Did I? Did I call you? <laughs> But you did, you did. <laughs> Maybe I did. <laughs> so the literature, the legend is he flirted with it and drove them crazy. The legends say that he began to, they would go out nightly and visit him, and he would like circulate among them. Sorry for the camera. He would circulate among them. The literature said he would touch them in various spots, and they would become mad with desire. Mad with desire. He would touch them. The chief among them, is Queen Radha. To make it accessible for us, acceptable, like this is, sounds like Disney. Do mm -hmm. sooner or later, Disney will turn this in. We'll okay. <laughs> <laughs> sounds like Disney. It's often seen that Radha represents our real nature. Our real nature, whatever we are, in the finest possible world, the beingness of us, is always that close to the absolute. It's like a dance. <clears throat> The other thing is, is desire, all desire, comes back to this desire for ultimate whatever, pleasure, unity, whatever completion. In our life, the highest pleasure many of us have experienced, some drug experiences, I don't do drugs, so I can't speak to it, okay, but intense sexual experiences. And by the way, we all know, sometimes sex is really great, Sometimes it's not so great. I'm talking about a real major, once or twice in a lifetime sexual experience. It's like, oh my God, you're just wrecked afterwards. Oh my, that kind of level of sexual power and energy, which embarrasses us because of the power of it. The power of it is so powerful. And the yearning for that kind of sense of release and unity and the mind disappearing. By the way, the Tibetans say that there are four times when the basic nature of mind is recognized, however instantaneously, and samsara disappears. They say at the moments of birth, at the moments of death, when you have a really powerful sneeze. <laughs> this is the classical literature, and when you have an orgasm, briefly. And they say that's part of the bliss of the sexual the energy is for a moment, you're just being. And then it comes back. Say, well, that was it. <laughs> Here it is. I remember Radha and Krishna at night, having obtained each other's company and being worshipped by Vrindas. Vrinda is like the goddess of Vrindavan, the forest, with many paraphernalia 
and who enjoy joking riddles, nice talks, plays, and raza, and lasa, dances along with their most beloved girlfriends. And I, can you see the picture? That's all the gopis in Krishna in the sacred raza or the dance in the moonlight at Vrindavan. You can imagine them, they're having the perfect dance. They contemplate love making and they drink honey wine, being masters in different kinds of could, uh, could you, uh, I can't pronounce conjugal. it. Conjugal, thank you. Conjugal joy. And the new kuni, kuni, so whatever that means, which increases their joy. I wonder what that was. After many pastimes, they go to sleep on a nice flower bed, being attended by their loving girlfriends. This is an, uh, now I get to, to uh, uh, Babita's teaching, you know, like I was looking at these frogs making this incredible racket. I said, God, they're making a hell of a lot of noise. And she said, Well, it's an orgy. <laughs> <laughs> this is an orgy. But it's a very nice orgy. I mean, they're, they're the nicest people. <laughs> With a humble appeal, Vrinda and her group brought Radha and Krishna to the veranda of the most beautiful jewel temple which was illumined by the light of the full moon. There she seated them on a golden flower throne and was covered with a fine sheet in a pleasant spot cooled by a breeze from the Yodumna at the river. Vrinda and her maidservants served Radha and Krishna with wonderful flower ornaments, garlands, bell leaves, scents, fans, and nice water, taken from the art studio, that's what it says. <laughs> Sing Vrindava. Sri Radha, the night, the Yerumna, and the banks, the desire to play. Raza arose in Krishna's heart. What is Raza? One by one, Krishna began all different items of his Raza festivals with the gopis, like the play in the forest, wandering and dancing in a circle, ladies dancing in a circle, mixed dances of ladies and young men, male dance, female dance, single dance, and essay song with Conjugal, 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 conjugal humors, dancing, and water sports. Krishna came across all the gopis bathing on the river. He playfully stole all of their clothes. <laughs> and then he sat up in a tree and he said, I want all of you one by one to come out and start nude and come and fetch your clothes. <laughs> and they each had to come out of the water naked, you know, like this, embarrassed, okay, totally revealed, and also so he could admire them. Now, I want to remind you, how many of us in the days of the guru had our guru kind of bring us up with him and then just embarrass the hell out of him by just saying, I adore you, my beloved. I think you're wonderful. And we all think, me, yeah. I'm hideous. Literally taking our shirt off in front of everyone. Mm. Taking your shirt. Yeah, I'll take that. Off goes. And you're you don't you're in kind of state of you're kind of stunned mm -hmm. in all her consciousness a little bit. And yeah. afterwards, I suppose you could file a lawsuit. But at the moment, you know, <laughs> what's going on? No, at the moment it's like okay. You're, you're right in the flow of it. Right there. I have a picture. I won't. I, I'll pick up that. Here you go. Here is Krishna in the water with his gopis enjoying water sports. <laughs> <laughs> They're playing in the water, and he makes them come out of the water one by one. <laughs> no, it's not like Marco Polo. It's not like Marco Polo. Or maybe it is like Marco Polo. <laughs> The soft breeze caused the vines and the trees that were illumined by the full moon to tremble. Krishna's presence in the spring season beautified the forest more and more, and Krishna's desires for enjoyment were aroused by seeing the nice forest with its dancing peacocks and singing bees and preka birds. How many of you have been really... Sometimes when you were with Garage, for those like that late at night, you wanted to be nowhere else in the whole world. Yeah. You wanted to be, this was it. You, you couldn't believe your good fortune. And you were in the garden, you were in Vrindavan with Krishna, Lord Krishna. And he was joking and carrying around. 
is this unique to Goraj? One of my favorite passages in the, in the Gospel of Ramakrishna is early on when the person named M, Gahupta, I can't remember his full name, but later on, he talked about his first meetings with Ramakrishna. He said it was a veritable garden of mirth. <laughs> it was a veritable garden of mirth. He said everybody was joking and kidding around. Nobody was serious. They were playing pranks all the time. It sounded a lot like the, the old days with AMS. It was just like the garden of Nirvana. It was just like this, the Raza of Krishna. So, the luster of the white moon is beautifying the forest and its flowers, marrying my desires to be enjoyed with you. Anyway, it goes on and on like this. And you can find it on the internet. I invite you of them getting it on. Mm -hmm. Krishna with uh, the gopis and with, with Radha. Now, the story ends that they loved each other passionately. Krishna goes off and becomes Lord Krishna, and he rules a kingdom. Lord Krishna becomes the figure, the central figure in the Mahabharata. The Mahabharata is a gigantic Indian epic. Part of the Mahabharata, it's about a, a, a war between two rival kingdoms. Krishna serves with the most perfect warrior, Arjuna, on the good guy side, and their opposites is his brothers and kinsmen on the bad guy side. Okay? Krishna counsels Arjuna at the time of the crisis of the battle, and that's the Bhagavad Gita. It's counsel in a time of war between Lord Krishna, God itself, the Godhead, and all of us in the form of Arjuna in the most difficult time of his life, where he's completely, his loyalties are incredibly divided, and he's lost his sense of what he should do next and Krishna counsels him. The Bhagavad Gita is great advice on how to live your life. That's Lord Krishna. By the way, Krishna at the end of his life, according to his legend, went back to rule his kingdom, well, and eventually, I'll tell you, eventually his, his kingdom is invaded and he's killed. But before he gets there, there's supposedly, he leaves Radha behind in the forest, sitting right out of Casablanca. <laughs> she waits and waits and waits while he does all his business. They are reunited at the end, and there's a gigantic wedding. Millions of people witnessed it. And they have a spectacular time of death. Hmm. So it's a little like somehow if, if uh, what was the name of the guy, Casablanca, that she goes off with? Victor, oh, Victor Victor Laszlo. If Victor Laszlo had said, you know what, dear, you know, I love you very much, but you know, I've been married this whole time. I hate to tell you this. What? And then she could have gotten that with Rick, and they could have sold the cafe. Well, Rick was going off, right? He'd sold the cafe, mm -hmm. Cafe America, and they'd go off together to America. Mm -hmm. So, Krishna, what do people pay Krishna? What do you bring to Krishna? Devotion. You bring your devotion. You pay with your life. What does Krishna give you in return? Devotion. He gives you his devotion. It doesn't mean he's always present for you, but he gives you his devotion. Okay, he gives you his life. So all that's background, how much time do I have? Half an hour? Half hour. Good. Yep. I'm going to read you my favorite satsang. Okay, giving you the background of what I think uh, some of what was perhaps in Guru Raj's mind, I could never predict him when he said this outrageous thing. I was a male prostitute, it was so Christian. Mm -hmm. Male prostitute. Mm -hmm. By the way, you know, services people, messes with them, you know, makes people, you know, what would you like? You know, I said, well, I think I would like wisdom. Oh, that's really nice. Well, would you like wisdom or would you like total pleasure? <laughs> What's the difference? <laughs> yeah. Do you remember the judgment of Paris? Do you remember he had three choices? What did, what did Paris, the, the young prince to Paris, he could choose between three beautiful goddesses or three different outcomes in life? He could choose great wisdom, okay? He could choose worldly success and power over dominion. That would you know. Wisdom was Minerva. Or he could choose to be the most incredible sex you could possibly imagine with the most beautiful woman in the entire world. Mm, <laughs> 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 and 
invariably a tail. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, before you go on, I want to tell you, I was in Fairfield and I ran into this guy because we were renting a place, you know, just to stay there because my husband likes to go up there and meditate with his kids living there. And there was a gentleman who had a bit of an English accent. I kept thinking, hmm, we got English around here, but he was South African. And I, I walked up to him and I said, you know, I had the most wonderful tantric master, illuminated, who just is illuminating all of us still, and the body. And he said, what was his name? I said, he was in Cape Town, and he went by Guru Rajanadi Yogi. And he says, what was his other name? And I said, Perry Shortrum, Velody, and he says, oh my God. He took up with my roommate. <laughs> and I said, you're kidding me. And he said, no, he came and he stayed at our house. He was lovers with Marguerite, or what was her name? Uh, what Mary. Was her? <laughs> Marguerite. And, and uh, he took in. Now, meanwhile, he was married. And I was thinking, hmm, he was really getting right. So he, they were doing a puja one night. It was a short. And, he, um, they, and Guru Raj said, I would love to do the puja tonight. So they put him in charge of doing the puja. So he went over and he... Um, you know, was getting ready, everybody was sitting down, and they, he said, are you ready for the music now? And he turned it on, and they were just amazed. So he was doing the siddhas for them, just magic all the way from getting the girl, her falling in love, and beginning the organization that we still have. That was straight from stealing uh, the best teacher that Maharishi ever had. Yeah. <laughs> I just thought I'd tell you that one. And I heard that, you know, from uh, the person there. One of my first courses, I, I did, had nothing particularly going on Krishna that I could remember from this life. And then I had a wonderful experience with Krishna in one of my first courses with, with Guru Raj. And then he gave the sense. Mm -hmm. By the way, uh, Guru Raj gave me uh, one of my central problems in the life. I said, but Guru Raj, it was so real. It was so real. It was realer than this room. He says, of course. Oh, this is an illusion. That's non-dual debate, and I've been working on that since. <laughs> but what's not an illusion is that we just, whether we want to or not, whether it's good for us or not, there's something in us that wants to get it on. <laughs> I don't know what that is. <laughs> so he gave this wonderful song, the question from, and I forgot <clears throat> who asked the question, what is the meaning of the smile of Krishna? This is my favorite sense. Or... What is mankind? Mm. What kind of man? Right. In the beginning, he says, what kind of man are you talking about? Or what kind of man do you mean? And he laughs. That's very significant. Is he talking about ordinary humanity? Or are we talking about divine humanity? As Krishna was. So that was very significant. I always read significant. He says. Then he launches into it, what is the meaning of the smile of Krishna? He pauses for a while. I don't have the actual tape, so I'm going to read it. But it's better because it, you, you'll get my uh, a devotee's version of it, and I might inflect it differently. We've heard him so many times now, many of us just space out and go into the voice. Yeah. The smile of Krishna is rather more a theme for poetry than the subject for a talk. The smile of Krishna is the smile that smiles through the entire universe because his smile is the creation of the universe. Because Krishna or Christ smiles, this universe as we know it is created. I'm going to pause there. Suja made a very interesting up. Yeah, I know. I should have. I don't want to get the microphone up, but I'll try to speak very loud. Maybe we should just no. get it so no. it goes off. Uh, because it'll take 10 minutes and people's head will go south. Uh, when he says the creation of the universe, Sujay made the very interesting point that we're all incarnations. This universe is us. I'm looking at myself. All of you are looking at yourself. I guess one way to think of it is wherever we go, there we are. <laughs> When we die, something else happens. Uh, Sujay was pointing out the awareness remains, beingness remains. One of you asked a very interesting question to me or somebody, you said, but then why is all this happening? I mean, why, oh, Laureate asked me, why do people have thoughts? Why does this universe show up? 
did it come from? Where does it come from? If beingness is what it really is, why didn't it just stay the hell down there in beingness and just shut up? Why does it make all this? So Guruaj is answering this. Because Krishna or Christ smiles, this universe as we know it is created. <clears throat> now to me, Christ or Krishna or Buddha mean the same. I'm more interested in Krishna consciousness or Christ consciousness. He says, drop your hang up on whether you're a Christian or a Vaishnavite or Siva. That's, that's not the point. The point of it is embodied divinity. And that very consciousness is a smile. For consciousness, with its cognition of the universe, that's the, in other words, in a certain way, this is a dream, a cosmic dream. This is the creation of the universe. In a way, it's a thought. This universe cannot help but smile. It's a pity we haven't got Jesus' picture here. All the pictures you've seen of Jesus are all totally false, just artist impressions. When I was a young lad, I had visions of him, and I used to see him totally clearly. Some of us have had visions of deity. The Buddhists call it seeing something on the Shambhogi Kaya level. You have an experience and you realize, oh my God, in some of these things are alive. I didn't know that. And simultaneously you realize that we are just dream, we're complete fictions, who yeah. we think we are. Complete fictions, complete illusions. They're just artist impressions. He never had that sad face with all the tears <coughs> down his cheeks. <laughs> He was a cheerful person, <laughs> therefore he taught, be of good cheer. If he was crying all the time, like the pictures depict him, he would not have taught, be of good cheer. So that's the Christ smile, and that's the Krishna smile, to be of good cheer. Guraj laughed and smiled almost continually. We've all seen what happens when the cameras turn around and face the audience. What do we look like? Like racks of the living dead. Yeah. Yeah. And everything is cheerful if you just know how to recognize the cheer. Cheer or the smile becomes distorted because of your mind. Your mind is that which distorts cheerfulness into cheerlessness. But what about all the homeless? But what about all of the people uh, sold into sexual slavery? What about all the sweatshops? What about all the whales? What about the overfishing of the cods on the north banks? We won't have any cod left. What about the depletion of the ozone layer? What about the... Cheer, the smile, becomes distorted because of your mind. Your mind is that which distorts cheerfulness into cheerlessness. So if you look around you, everything is smiling all the time. The flowers are smiling, the plants are smiling, this thing is smiling. Everything just smiles. But that recognition of the smile of Krishna or the smile of life it must come from you. You have to recognize it in order to know it. Have you really seen Krishna smile? Of course you have. Every time I smile at you, that's Krishna's smile. Because I don't find any difference between his consciousness apart from mine. It's just one consciousness. And I'm smiling through his smile, and he smiles through my smile. And yet, if you would watch the smile carefully, you would feel it just bubbling over. <laughs> For I never smile with my lips. I just pull them. <laughs> you know the people like, social <laughs> smile? <laughs> I. <laughs> there you go. Hey, I'm glad to see you. Glad to see you. Would you like to sit down here? We'll go over the forms. <laughs>
This is a guaranteed investment vehicle. You know, last 10 years, performance have been over 8%. <laughs> 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 it's minimal. <honest, but> <laughs> And I'm smiling through his smile, and he smiles through my smile, and yet if you would watch that smile carefully, you would feel it just bubbling over, for I never smile with my lips, I just pull them. I smile with my eyes, and there lies the beauty of a smile, not just the pulling of the lips or whichever way. With every time the lips are formed into a smile, your eyes must sparkle with that radiance, and then over the years of the smile. Mm -hmm. You guys been around people in high developed spiritual moods or around a teacher, it's actually very hard to look at them. You, 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 unless you're in a similar state. They embarrass you. It's very hard to take it because these people are just in a state of bliss. <laughs> the smile of Krishna, which we can equate with, the, with creation. I'll read it again. I want to check the watch. The smile of Krishna we can create with creation. For everything is creating and recreating itself all the time. Everything is like this with everything else in creation. And they're all, it's all having a lovely time with each other. <laughs> Nothing stands still. Everything is in motion. Even a stone, although it might be lying there seemingly still, is in perpetual motion all the time. All the millions and millions of molecules swirling in that piece of stone, that is the smile of Krishna. Do you know the old model for, by the way, the universe is composed of Shetron, so it's just a concept. <laughs> <laughs> but let's go with the concept. The old notion of the universe was an inter interstellar void of emptiness, a cold, freezing, inhospitable cold with dark rocks and then huge balls of burning gas <laughs> and frigid methane atmosphere over here. So, what's it called? Mars, a cold, barren wilderness, no air. <laughs> you know, the new model of the